I'm <laughs> glad to have this option. Thank you. Okay. Good. Well, it's good. To, I'm glad. I'm glad you're you're with us. And um, so, so yes. Thank you, Karen, for the reminder to record. So now we're recording, and then um, and and we'll just click it off for the for the very end of the end of the session. Um, so we are at the third session of the resurrection study. In our first session, we discussed the resurrection of Jesus from the perspective of the four gardens, right? And how the resurrection of this single God man was a foreshadowing of the promise of renewed transformed creation, which in the end will be total. A new heaven, renewed heaven and renewed earth where God's beautiful, intention expressed in the image of the Garden of Eden of a whole harmonious, suffering-free world, um, sorrow and, 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 and death finally released, um, is, is prefigured or pre-imaged by the resurrection of Jesus Christ with not a spiritual immaterial body, but a glorified material body pointing to the glorified new heaven and earth, the garden paradise, right? That was the fourth garden. Then in our second session, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the three trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the cross tree and the tree of life and consider that that um, dimension of the resurrection that has to do with human sin and divine forgiveness. That essentially in the crucifixion, God received the weight of human sin and suffering unto death into God's self. And at the resurrection, God um, not only defeated the wages of sin, which is death, not only defeated death, but returned forgiveness. That was God's judgment upon humanity, not punishment and wrath, but forever forgiveness. And we are proclaimed forgiven and beloved through Jesus. And even with that, with those two big kind of categories of considering the resurrection, we're just scratching the surface. We are we are getting to the, the, our heads around part of the iceberg that is poking up above the water, remembering how deep and broad the mystery goes. Um, so this week we are considering the dimension of the resurrection revealed in breath, specifically two breaths, um, and specifically what happens after Jesus's 40 days of resurrection appearances. So as we've done in the other two sessions, we begin again at the beginning, at the very first page of the Bible. So I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter one. If you have it, I'll also pull it up in, in just a minute here. But, um, but as you do that, as you turn to chapter one of Genesis, I want to tell you a, 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 just a weird epiphany moment that I had up in Vermont, one, and this is appropriate for today, one bitter cold winter Vermont day. And this, this was not like beautiful, snowy Vermont. This was like harsh, I'm going to kill you, Vermont, you know, if you stay out in my in my weather for more than five minutes. It was below, it was, it was windy and it was below zero, bitter, white, harsh day. And as I was approaching, I was in my car and I was approaching a, a stop sign. And as I approached the stop sign, I noticed something ahead in the road. Um, and, and I looked at it as I slowly drove past. And it was a large rabbit squashed flat on the road, completely dead, lifeless, still, and thoroughly frozen. I mean, it might have just been there for 15 minutes, but it was thoroughly frozen, just lying there in the middle of the road. And as I looked at it and I drove past it, I had this moment where I was so struck and in awe of the life force in this world the life force that was so strangely and glaringly absent in the squished rabbit. For some reason, it just struck me 
it was so absent there, though at some point it had been full of life, warm in itself, purpose-driven towards whatever it was, wherever it was going for whatever reason. It was not plugged into anything, nor did it have any fuel per se, not wound up by someone, but it was a soft, fluffy, mindful, blood pulsing, purpose driven little life force going about in this world until it wasn't any longer, thanks to a car or, or whatever. But for some reason, it felt like for me, it was this moment of feeling like this glimpse into the miracle of life. That it is a miracle that we're alive and that we're sustained in, in this life. You know, we're not connected. To, I mean, materially, but well, you can't even say that, right? I mean, who knows on what levels we are connected to, to something that keeps us alive, but but you, you get what I'm saying. There, there, there's this evangelical pastor who lives out in, in um, uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, and he's a professor and a, and a pastor and has a um, podcast. And his name is Tim Mackey. And he tell, I, I just heard him tell of something similar when he said his four-year-old son and he were out in their garden watching a slug. And his son asked him, why is it going, daddy? <laughs> looked at it and said, why is it going? And Tim was taken aback and said, you mean, where is it going? And he said, no, I mean, why is it going? So his son was apparently having a similar kind of experience to, to mine. Why does this squishy, slow, slimy, trail leaving slug thing go? How does it have life? And the answer to that question, why is the rabbit and the slug and each of us going daddy, is what the writer of Genesis sought to answer, is the, you know, the revelation of our, of our scriptures. So chapter one, I will um, share the screen here, but you all can read it. How about if we read, since, we're, since it's not much, we'll read it from a couple of different translations. Can everybody see that? Yes. Um, let me just start this. Um, okay, I'm not, I'm not sure which translation this is, but, um, but let's, let's go here. Will, some, will someone read that either from their Bible or from the screen ahead of them? And this, oh, this is actually the King, I think this is the King James version or, or the new King James version or something like that. Um, can you see that? Can you read that, Asako? Yes. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Someone else have an alternative translation they can share? Yeah, Julianne. I have the New American Standard in front of me. And that reads... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Mm. And does anyone have in their translation, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters? Mm. Julianne said, moved. But hovered is another is another way it's translated. This the spirit of God hovering over the waters of, of chaos, and 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 the deep, the deep, the darkness, and that is the answer to the question of life. That behind the existence of life is a personal is is a presence, an intentional, creative act on behalf of a creator God, a father, mother God giving birth to it all, giving life, giving life out of 
God's self. And that is one of the chief revelations of, of, um, of this presence that we speak of when we say God, that God is a life-giving force that donates out of God's self to create and sustain the world. What's interesting, I, I think, when you look at these very first three verses in the, in the first, on the first page of the Bible is, is that there is this effort on behalf of the biblical writers that will actually run throughout the whole Bible, especially in, into the New Testament, to speak of God, this presence of the divine, as, as one presence but with multiple aspects to it, to him, to her, to God. And so right here at the beginning, you have the writer of Genesis refer to God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And then you have the spirit of God. But also you have the spoken word of God. So you have the three aspects of what we as Christians would call the Trinity from the very first three verses of the scriptures. God, the spirit of God, um, the voice of God, God said, the word of God, that that's, the cre that's where creation comes. For the last two sessions, we've spoken of the first person of the Trinity, God, Father, Creator, um, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus as Son and Redeemer. And so now today under the heading of two breaths, we're going to look at the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of the resurrected Christ, because it is obviously central to the resurrection. You can't have the resurrection. You can't consider the resurrection without the spirit of God without God, without Jesus of God, and without the Spirit of God. So the Hebrew, the Hebrew um, word for spirit is the same as breath. And so, so we come to our first breath, and that is the very breath of life that makes the bunny rabbit go and the slug and you and me and everyone go. And it is pure donation, pure gift from God that grants us life unearned and unexpected and will be in us as long as it is in us. And all we can do is say, thank you for this life breath, God. So the Hebrew word for spirit and breath um, in the Old Testament is, is what? Does anybody know it? Starts with an R. It's a great breathy word. Ruah. Ruah. Right. So say that ruach. I mean, it makes you breathe the word out, ruach. And you gotta, you gotta do that, right? Ruach. It's it's actually a feminine noun in in Hebrew. Um, but this feminine, that you know, so it's interesting, and and that's where when when we have one place in our hymn hymnody where we refer to God's God in in. Um, in our traditional hymn, hymnody, um, that we refer to God as a, as a woman, and that is the wisdom of God being female, right? And, that, and that's in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, O Come Thou Wisdom from on high, and it refers to, to the wisdom of God as female. But that goes back to, this, to, to Ruach and the breath of God and the wisdom of God. In Greek, the word is pneuma, which also can be used for both breath or spirit. So there's something central, critical as the writers, as the, the revelation from God of the scriptures, as the writers were, were trying to articulate who God is in relation to creation, breath was, was central and it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so let me, let's go to the next, the next, passage, if we turn just a, a chapter beyond it to Genesis 2, chapter 7. And um, Karen, will you just, will you read that either on the screen or on, in your scripture? 
Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Someone have a different translation of that to share? So the New American version, again, is quite close, but I think it's a small but important um, difference. There's no the. So then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and mm. breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Interesting. So kind of you get a sense of a more generalized humanity as opposed to a man. Uh, a man. Or the man. Mm. Right. So the breath of life being given by God, donated freely. So there is God and there is the Son of God and there is the Spirit of God, the Ruach. And, and so what we're going to do here is, is a brief survey of spirit, of spirit through the Bible to just lift out how important this concept is of, of spirit to, to the whole scriptural account, but, but also to the resurrection. Um, and so um, this is way too quick. It, it's way more involved in this, but um, there is the spirit of God, the breath of God in the very beginning that hovers over the chaotic, formless void of existence and helps to bring order and life to it. So just consider as you think of the spirit of God, like what, how do we relate to the spirit of God? How do we experience the spirit of God in our lives? And note these qualities, note, note what the spirit does. So br helps bring order and life to what is chaotic and lacking life. Um, so, so on one level, we say God's spirit sustains all life. And you might say that God's spirit is an impersonal, energetic field of life permeating existence. And we would be in company with many other traditions to say that, and particularly, you know, the, the um, Gaia, Gaia tradition of the, the breathing of, of life itself, of the earth. Um, and, and more of a pagan sense of, of, of all of um, creation is God, right? So on a certain level, yeah, we as Christians say, yeah, but it's not where we stop because the Judeo-Christian tradition does, won't leave it there. It speaks of spirit as the source of life and sustaining all life, the energy pulse of life. But the Abrahamic religions, I should say Abrahamic religions, because including Judy, uh, um, Islam as well, insists that God and therefore God's spirit is personal and relational. It's not just an impersonal energy force, um, but it operates like that too. And so, in, so, so then in many places throughout the Old Testament, it speaks of the spirit of God coming upon people like patriarchs, kings and judges, and especially the prophets. So there's the spirit of God that is, that is the energy force and the life force that we would not exist without, that if it was withdrawn from us or the systems of our body broke down such that it couldn't sustain it, we would be dead. It would be gone from us. But then there's another layer or level of the spirit of God that comes to people throughout the Old Testament and the New. Um, and, and there are various things that, that this does. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me see where I should have. Um, yeah, let me just stop when I can so we can see each other better. And, and did you all have a good dinner, um, Jerry and Janet? Good. <laughs> we did, yes. See you back. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, so, so the spirit of God comes upon people. And um, especially the prophets, right? For, for many reasons, um, the spirit of God is coming to the prophets. One, to give them special, well, I mean, to all of these, many of these people in the, in the, New, uh, the Old Testament, to give them special wisdom and power to lead. That's often how the spirit 
um, is, is um, in, increases that capacity of wisdom and the power to lead. Secondly, to communicate through them, the spirit communicates through them God's purposes to the people of Israel. Thirdly, Joseph is an example. The spirit of God came to Joseph with Potiphar and, and that whole story to interpret dreams. Spirit helps interpret dreams. Fourth, through the prophets, the spirit of God warns of impending disaster because Israel is not being faithful to the covenant by worshiping idols and mistreating the most vulnerable among them, right? So there is this, it communicates God's purposes, um, but also challenges where a sense of this isn't right. There is right and I'm not living it. We're not living it. Um, the prophets are often having to speak that through the spirit, spirit of God. Um, and then a fifth example of this is, for instance, through the prophet Isaiah, there is the spirit of God talks about one coming who will have the spirit of God upon him in a very special way. All right. So remember this at Advent where we read, and so if you'll turn to, I turn to the prophets, Isaiah, um, and don't feel bad if you need to look on your table of contents as to where that is, but go past Psalms, for instance. It's not far past Psalms. And, and if you go to chapter 11 of Isaiah, you'll remember this quite well. Um, And I'm gonna screen share just because I've got all these nice pictures to accompany our reading. Um, all right, so you're familiar with this. Who who would read that ha that hasn't read yet? Um, do you have a bill? Can you see that okay? Um, oh, you're on. Can you unmute and then um, read that for us? A shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him or hover over him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Right, I meant to put that or hover over him in parentheses because that is another another translation. I don't know if any of you see that in your in your um, in your translation, but one of those is ref, refers again to this hovering over, which shows up time and time again. The spirit of the Lord will hover over him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Again, what are what is it that the spirit of God bestows upon the human being beyond a general life-giving force, which is pretty great in and of itself, but there's more. And, and this is what we as Christians read the, the, what, what the prophet was saying. And we say, um, um, this was referring to Jesus, right? So without, I'm going to stick with, um, the, with the screen share, and we jump from the Old Testament. There's a very quick survey of the Spirit in the Old Testament. There's a lot more of, of God's Spirit there, obviously. Um, but we jump into the New Testament, and we don't get a page or, into the New Testament. Um, well, if you, if you, you know, go, go to Luke, get a couple of pages in with Matthew without the Spirit of God showing up in a big way. Um, Ray Myers, would some would would you be willing to to, and just also yeah, would you be willing to read that? But the angel said to her, "Do not be afraid, Mary. You have." I can't see the next part. You have found. I know it's kind of jammed together. Favor with God. Favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you were to call him Jesus. He will be 
great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will come, will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Jew, hearing this this story being read for the for the first time um you are immediately brought back to to the the, the story of creation the holy spirit will come upon you and the most high will overshadow or hover above you so the holy one will to be born will be called the son of god so it just it harkens back and as we talked about with the four gardens, this sense of there, there is creation at the first, and then there is this new moment that happens at the incarnation that is an, another creation that the Spirit of God hovers and creates. Hovers, you might say, over the waters of Mary's womb to do something wholly new as a miraculous and original as the first creation. And the Holy One will be called the Son of God. And don't blink, because two chapters later, no sooner does Jesus show up on the scene as an adult and ready to begin his ministry than the Holy Spirit of God appears again and does a similar hovering, this time to express God's love for God's Son, Jesus. And so if you turn to, actually, let's, let's turn in our scriptures while we're at this. We'll turn to Luke chapter 3, because the, the Spirit is just really active here. Um, so if someone would, would read Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. This is kind of a cool image here, I thought. Um, Lori, will you read that? from either your translation or whatever's on the screen. What, tr do you, what translation do you have in front of you? I don't, <laughs> so okay. I'll read what's on the screen. Great. Um, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So another aspect, um, act of the Holy Spirit is to communicate not only God's purposes, but also God's love. And, and if you just think of that on a, on a personal level, if you've, if you've ever felt a sense of, of that kind of dis descend upon you out of nowhere, a sense of God's love for you, which I hope you have, um, you know, that's, that's what the, the Holy Spirit, that's the act of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, and then, interestingly, so that, that is so beautiful and moving and love loving. And then it says, the Holy Spirit does what? Drives Jesus out into the wilderness. Right, you know? drives him right immediately and immediately. Yes, <laughs> I love you, get out into the wilderness. <laughs> also, I was just gonna comment that in, that in that passage, what's really interesting is, and when all the people were being baptized, Mm. This wasn't a singular like event of Jesus going to be baptized. This was a huge collection of all people. And Jesus, one of the suggestions is that 
So Jesus joined all of humanity in his baptism, which meant that then all, when we are baptized, we hear the voice of God. And that it wasn't a singular event. It was a huge event. Uh, no, but really singular good. to Jesus hearing this. So, mm -hmm. um, Because when it says, and all the people who are being baptized, that always confused me. Mm -hmm. Because, well, but Jewish people were all baptized also for at that point in history. Mm, right. Yeah. That's a re really good point. And, and the whole thing of, of John saying, I can't, what, what are you doing? I, I can't do this. And Jesus saying, no, no, you need to. This, this kind of, I need to be a part of, of what's happening here and, and, and make this a part of me and make them a part of me. Mm. Any other, at this juncture, any other thoughts or reflections on where we find the Holy Spirit here. So then the Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness. And um, so we, you know, again, it's like this, this sense of, of the Holy Spirit of God is the presence of life, but you can have breath and life. And then there can be times when you are full of the, when one is full of the Holy Spirit too more than distinct from the impersonal life force, right? And I, I mean, don't we know that, that, that there's being alive and then there's being alive? <laughs> times when we feel more alive than other times more awake. Well, this paying attention to the creation mm. reminds me of a, a book that was published almost a hundred years ago mm. called God's Trombones. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> no. Howard, Howard Thurman, who was an outstanding oh, wow. Negro pastor and theologian, wrote this in the 1920s. It's a, a series of Negro sermons in verse. The Negro preachers in those days tended to tell the same stories over and over again, and the, the stories became quite poetic. Mm. Well, Howard Thurman wrote down some of these sermons in verse, and he's got a marvelous one called The Creation, and I'd like to read the first part of it. Great, please. And God stepped out on space, and he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything. Darkness blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. Then, well, it's a little hard. Keep your head up. It's a little hard to. We lost those last couple of lines. Then God smiled, and the light broke, and the darkness rolled up on one side, and the light stood shining on the other. And God said, "That's good." <laughs> then God reached out and took the light in His hands. And God rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun. And he set that sun ablazing in the heavens. And the light that was left from making the sun, God gathered it up in a shining ball and flung it against the darkness, spangling mm -hmm. the night with the moon and stars. And then down between the darkness and the light, he hurled the world. And God said, that's good. <laughs> anyway, the poem keeps going. And so That's beautiful. It's Pearl beautiful of the world. Movie. I love that. A little book called God's Trombones, which I happen to have, and I'll loan it to anybody who wants to borrow it because it's, it's got a whole bunch of poems. And another one that I love especially says, young man, your arm's too short to box with God. <laughs> to box with God. Oh, that's good. Hmm. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for sharing that. So, so that experience of, of, of life and then fuller life, life and then more life that the Holy Spirit grants is, is what something of what this, the scriptures are talking about. Um, the life force 
but but also more. <laughs> and so as far as Christian scriptures go, this concept of the Holy Spirit of God comes to a huge and dramatic culmination point, right? At the resurrection and brings us to breath two. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one breath, but I like the four gardens, three trees, two breaths. Because so, <laughs> you could say it's just one breath. But anyway, it comes to breath two, which, is, which comes from Jesus himself, the breath of Jesus. The same spirit that hovered over the waters of creation breathed by Jesus himself this time. But let's follow the story. So if you'll turn to, let's say, um, let's see. Um, John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. Um, and this is interesting. And, I, you know, it's just, this is kind of an interesting coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, so if someone would read that 19 to 20, John 20, 19 to 23, does someone, is someone willing to read that for us and tell us what translation you're reading it from? Well, I'll read it. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Right. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As a father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So interesting, huh? That that's that that's not what we read at Pentecost, is it? Um, it's not the, the story we read. What do you, what do you make of that? That that the reception of the Holy Spirit happens then. Any thoughts there? I'm going to screen share while. But that's the, um, this is an image of, of Jesus breathing on the disciples. The breath of the spirit of God hovers over Jesus at his baptism. Then there's these moments of Jesus's resurrected presence. And he breathes upon people here in his resurrected appearance. But the big moment of, that we call Pentecost um, happens, but not before, um, not before the what we refer to in Acts chapter one as as the ascension. Isn't this a, this is a cool image from uh, Dolly, Salvador Dolly of the ascension? It's called the ascension. Um, will someone read this on, on the screen or in their scriptures, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 11? Because this is, so Jesus appears to his disciples for, um, for 40 days in his glorified material body, and then it stops. Then the resurrection appearance is stopped for about 10 days. This is a, according to the gospel of, of Luke and, and, and Acts. Um, so will someone read that on the screen? I'll read. Okay. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, 
The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So we have this, this moment of, of Jesus in his, you might say, the, the way that Cynthia Bourgeau speaks of it um, um, is that Jesus was in his dense form, a dense material glorified bodily form, and needed to release that dense form in order for his spirit, his spirit to be no longer located in that dense form, but rather, but rather spread out is, is one way of thinking of it. Um, so, so we have the ascension, Jesus ascends um, is, the, is the imagery we have. And then we have the big moment that we call Pentecost and um, ten, that happens 10 days later. And um, will someone read that? on the screen, Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. Use Lynn's glasses. Oh, my uh -huh. gosh. Got big <laughs> she loves to cook. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, 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 no. When the day of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to the rest to rest on the, each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Right. So you have this once again, this coming of the Holy Spirit, this hovering over them, resting on each tongues of as though tongues of flame resting on each of them. And this is the second breath of the renewed creation. It begins here, we, we say. This ragtag bunch of, of the least, the last, the lost, the losers find the courage and the passion to go forth and share the gospel, the good news that God is sovereign and that God's first and final word, God's son, Jesus Christ has shown God's love for us, forgiven us and called us to live renewed and regenerated lives and gathers us into community. So this is another act of the Holy Spirit, right? It's not an individual religious experience. It is that the Holy Spirit, well, I'm not gonna say the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way, but at least scripturally, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, it's not an, it, 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 or it doesn't end with an individual spiritual experience. The Holy Spirit operates um, and, and draws us together into communities of this new forgiven and loving reality that is known as the church. And this is the, the, the big work of the Holy Spirit that circles us back to the notion of the left-handed power of God right, that we talked about before, that God does not come down and fix everything or wipe out the evil in the world or destroy all of life and start over, but rather our God of love, which is what we'll get to next week, comes in the power of the Holy Spirit to touch hearts and change lives and connect people and heal what is broken without taking away people's freedom, without threat, without controlling anything. I mean, what a tedious way to regenerate the world in and through the fickle human heart. 
And that's why it's taking 2,000 years maybe and, and might take another 2,000 more to do it. Um, but I wanna end with these words, if we can, from Frederick Beekner and, um, and then we'll, um, we'll have a few minutes to, to reflect on these. So there's three sections here if, um, um, if people can, can read those. Let's say, um, um, who has, has anyone not read yet? Has everyone read? Becky, yeah, would you start, would you start off and sure. then, and sure. then, um, and then George or, or Ken read the second one and, um, and Julianne read the final one. Most of the time we tend to think of life as a neutral kind of thing. I suppose we are born into it one fine day, given life and in itself, life is neither good nor bad, except as we make it. So by the way that we live it. Um, Ken, you're uh, muted, I think. We may make a full life for ourselves or an empty life, but no matter what we make of it, the common view is that life itself, whatever life is, does not care one way or another any more than the ocean cares, whether we swim in it or drown in it. In honesty, one has to admit that a great deal of the evidence supports such a view. But rightly or wrongly, the Christian faith flatly contradicts it. To say that God is spirit is to say that life does care, that the life-giving power that life itself comes from is not indifferent as to whether we sink or swim. It wants us to swim. It is to say that whether you call this life-giving power the spirit of God or reality or the life force or anything else, its most basic characteristic is that it wishes us well and is at work toward that end. Most basic characteristic of the spirit of God or the life force is that it wishes us well and is at work toward that end. Amen. Yeah, please, Ken. Um, it struck me too that in that first passage that you brought up about the spirit, uh, the first passage of Jesus with the disciples, um, that he gives that he breathes on them the spirit and he says, now you may whoever you forgive will be forgiven the sins of those you forgive and those that you retain will be retained and that's always been such mm. a difficult passage and recently i've been reading some things about it as as jesus is saying to us we it is for us to do what he did which is forgive he forgave mm -hmm. and that if we don't do that we actually bind people and they can't form community uh, with us etc so I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that was a particularly important piece for us to know we're mm -hmm. given this power to forgive and to live the life of Jesus uh, who showed us how or to withhold, which then binds us and the people we're with, in a way, by refusing to forgive. So, Amen. Thanks. Amen. And that is the whole, the work of the Holy Spirit that inspires that forgiveness, right? That's what we would say. Karen? Yes, I just am not sure when you want to stop the recording. Oh, okay. Yes. So thank you for, um, for reminding me. I am going to stop it.